Imagine you have an adorable little baby, one you just can't wait to care for. And when it's cold out, you wrap her in her warm clothing. And when she's hungry, you feed her, but she smears food all over her face. But no problem. You're going to put her into her tubby, get her cleaned up, fresh jammies, safely into bed. Now, imagine that baby is over five feet tall. Welcome to elder care. My family knows something about elder care because in the 1990s, five of our beloved relatives fell all at once to Alzheimer's disease. My mom, my three aunts, and my uncle. Their ordeal lasted almost two entire decades, and my sisters and I stepped in and cared for them, all five of them, all at once. For those almost two entire decades, all five of our relatives were very active people throughout their lives, but none was more active than my mom, Jessie. My mom was a beautiful lady, full of life and song. She loved to socialize and entertain. She was a good golfer. She loved to dance. Basically, she loved to party. <laughs> And she had a beautiful voice. She performed often to many accolades throughout her life. You could say that "carpe diem" was her motto: seize the day, seize the moment. But when my mom was in her early 70s, she started seizing the moment a little too exclusively. So much so that by the fall of 2012, when she passed, that now moment. That present moment she loved so much seemed all she ever knew. She was 92 years old. When our caregiving journey really got further underway, I started noticing that we caregivers needed to seize the moment. We needed to get a handle on time, because everything had to happen now. Medications had to happen now. Pill boxes. Now, social security, banks—you get the picture. Now seemed to call me on the phone constantly, day and night. It called me at work. One day it called me at work to tell me that my uncle's Bronco went missing.、Uh, turns out it was a case of elder scamming. His neighbor just thought the Bronco would look better in her garage. When it inevitably did not. My sister and I marched over there, and we stole it back. <laughs> we broke into the garage, we put the Bronco into neutral, and we pushed it back out across the front lawns and back into my uncle's garage. In our heels. <laughs> Now seemed to have direct access to my conscience via an alert button that it slammed 24/7 about these things. It slammed it all day long about things like this. Gas burners flaming unattended at my aunt's. I couldn't get over there fast enough to turn them off, but I finally did. And then I bolted through the house to make sure that nothing else was wrong. Plenty was wrong, but I did find my aunt. She was safe. She was okay. She was sitting in her living room, watching Bill Clinton on the news. I said, "Aunt Frances, the house almost burned down. Are you okay?" She said, "Who's that good-looking man on the television?" I said, "Aunt Frances, that's the president." She said, "Ah, of what?" <laughs> Meanwhile, now kept disappearing into the future, so I chased it there to a closed pharmacy, and I, of course, had to get over to my mom's afterward without her medication. But she was sitting in her padded chair. She was happy. She was singing Puccini. So I started listening for once, and when I did, I noticed that now slid over and made room for me. So I pulled up a chair. I sat with my mom. I held her hand. I sang a little Puccini. Badly, but I found myself coming finally, and reluctantly, and rather easily, into the moment.
So living in the now is healthy. You've probably heard, like a big old salad. For me, it was caregiving that showed me that I had to slow down and reach out and actually be, actually exist in the moment with my caregivers, with everyone. Because in any given moment, where else to be? Caregiving also showed me that meditation may not be a bad idea. So、uh, the more I tuned my mind through that great practice, the, more, the better caregiver I became. I actually surpassed caregiving and became an actual companion to my caregivers. I became a better person. I was lucky enough to be speaking about these things recently with Bowden Colheed, who is the abbot and director of the Rochester Zen Center. And the thing I liked about speaking with him is he has this concise way of thinking about that new buzzword, mindfulness. He asked me, Phyllis, you know that New York State Lotto advertisement? You know, the one plastered on the sides of buses and tooling around town some years ago that said. You gotta be present to win. <laughs> That's concise, and even New York State thinks we do. So back to caregiving. Caregiving is nearly impossible in a world poorly aligned with having to be present. Take my word for it. I tried to explain the job to my high school students recently. And not surprisingly, they came back with the most amazing questions, as teenagers always do. For example, Ms. Peters, how did you end up with five people to care for all at once? Well, we had my mom, and my three aunts and uncle did not have children, so my sisters and I stepped in. We would do it again if called upon, but it was tough, very hard. Miss Peters, are you afraid of getting Alzheimer's yourself? Uh, yes. <laughs> Hello, yes. Please, next question. Miss <laughs> Peters, how did you feel about your mom not knowing who you were? That was a difficult question. When you are the elder caregiver to someone who is not only has Alzheimer's but is your loved one, that is the difficult question. I realized that to answer it, I had to delve back into my mom's end of life and pull out a story, because the only way to answer such a difficult question is with a whole story. So I did address that insightful young man's question. And the story went like this: When my mom was at the end of her life, she was in a nursing home, and she was in what they called the memory care unit. And she would often be slumped over in her chair and staring at nothing. And I would come in and try to get in her line of vision, and get her attention, and say, "Mom, Mom, it's me, Phyllis. Mom." And my mom would look up. No recognition on her face whatsoever, and it was at those moments that I would step outside of the present moment, outside of that reality, on purpose, because it just felt safer there. And yet, and yet, at the very end of my mom's life, sometimes she would look up and she would smile—that awesome smile. And that smile spoke volumes. It told the story of our family, my childhood. It called me daughter, and that implied recognition. And recognition, in my book, implies memory. It's the stuff now is made of. I would like to close today by sharing with you all that the most profound irony of my life. Has been learning to enjoy the immediate present from someone who could not do otherwise. Singing Italian opera, holding hands quietly—this is a gift. It is an invitation to escape our perverted sense of time. 
I'm starting to believe that any adversity, even caregiving, can be that invitation. And I'm certainly not saying that Alzheimer's or dementia possess any redeeming qualities whatsoever. I'm simply saying that if we're open to it, now can be found in the damnedest moments. And I think we should find it, just in case we're forced in the future to stay there. Thank you.